Okay, good afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening, this afternoon for a wild goose night with Brian McLaren and Diana Butler Bass. Uh, I'm Robin Schuster. I'm on the wild goose staff just as of this year and uh, I'll work with our partners, sponsors, donors. And I can't believe that that has led to me being able to um, greet you this evening and introduce Brian and Diana to you. Just a few key points that I, I would like to uh, cover and then I'll turn it over to our special guests. Most of you who are on this meeting certainly know both Brian and Diana, but um, Brian McLaren, author of many great books, including the most recent Faith After Doubt, teacher with the Center for Action and Contemplation, a longtime fan of Wild Goose, so much so that he is on the board for Wild Goose Festival and will be gathering the goose this year uh, on Thursday evening along with Jennifer Knapp, so opening the festival up for us. Diana Butler Bass, also author of many great books, including most recently Freeing Jesus, independent scholar, public teacher, wild goose regular, and sending the goose for us this year. So closing the festival out on Sunday. So we are getting a little taste tonight of um, the great beginning and the great ending to this year's festival. No one, there will be lots of good stuff in between, just like there will be lots of good stuff tonight. So with that, I will turn it over to you guys. Thanks so much for doing this. Hey, it's great to be with you all. I, I don't know, it might be the first time that Brian and I have ever been introduced as Alpha and Omega. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of him uh, opening and me closing is, is uh, really fun for this coming year for Wild Goose. Um, tonight, we're just delighted to be able to be with friends to talk about uh, the two books that we published uh, within months of each other this year um, and a particular angle um, on those books. Uh, if we were going to be, I I'm coming very late to the goose, but if I had been there early the whole time, Brian and I would be in a tent doing this uh, with you all. Uh, but uh, because I'm going to be a late show, we're going to do it uh, this way instead. And that is uh, his book, Faith After Doubt, and my book, Freeing Jesus, uh, both have really strong elements of memoir. And we're telling theological stories through our own stories. As a matter of fact, the, the books uh, echo one another so richly that when I started doing my uh, book tour stuff, people began to ask me if I knew Brian's book because my book reminded them of the book that he had just published. And so I got to tell the story a few times, which I'd like to start with tonight, um, about uh, where these books were born and why they kind of sound alike. And um, it is because of a particular event. Uh, the last time, I guess it was three years ago, three summers ago, it's hard to keep track of time post pandemic. Uh, Brian and I were co speaking at Ring Lake Ranch um, one summer. And uh, we were, I can, I can remember the afternoon, we were sitting together on chairs on a really kind of warm Wyoming afternoon, looking out over the lake um, at the place of a, a beautiful Ring Lake Ranch. And uh, we were talking about our next projects. And in that conversation, we were both reflecting on what it was like to turn 60. Um, Brian's just uh, two years older than me, so we're pretty much at the same age cohort. And how that had affected the way we think about God and the way we think about theology and what's important to us now versus uh, what was important to us even 10 maybe 15 years ago. And so, so we were doing that kind of reflecting on our own stories, um, where we were in our life timeline, and the kinds of themes that we wanted to pull out in our next books. And both of us were really interested in doing something that was just straight up um, theological. So, so 
there was this sort of common interest that we had. And as the conversation unfolded, we also talked about not just um, our life experience in a kind of random way or turning 60 as a, like, oh my, can you believe that this is happening to us? Um, but we were also talking about faith development literature and how uh, different writers uh, had who write about stages of faith and um, how the spiritual journey unfolds uh, had influenced us. And it, throughout that conversation, we just sort of lightly sprinkled in our interest in someone like James Fowler, my interest in feminist um, theological development uh, literature, and uh, talked a little bit about spiral dynamics um, and integrative theories. And so, so if Faith After Doubt and Freeing Jesus, and for those of you who have read them both or have them both sitting on your desk, uh, seem like they're similar kinds of books to you, it's because there was a starting place of conversation um, that Brian and I shared on a summer day a few years ago. And it was out of that conversation of uh, these two books developed. Um, we did not track each other as we were writing them. You know, we didn't like uh, send messages back and forth and, and compare notes along the writing process way, except for very, very occasionally. Um, so they were independently written, but had the same, what I would call the same nascent place, the same birthplace. So, um, with that, I just think we can kind of get started. Um, as Brian and I really care about this topic a lot, why it is our personal stories and theology together are such an important pairing and what it might mean for the writing of theology in the future. Um, but it's always, if you ever get a chance to go to Ring Lake Ranch, I hope you will uh, take that opportunity. Um, uh, and I, I, Diane, I was glad you recalled our conversation about turning 60. Um, and, and I know for folks, it's really hard to believe because I'm 65. I know I don't look a day over 75, but, um, but uh, Diana, when you wrote Freeing Jesus, in a way what that book be, became is, here's what Jesus looked like to me as an eight-year-old. And here's what Jesus looked like to me as a 25-year-old. and you know, in some ways it was a way of saying, almost like a, you know, there are those 360 cameras. Um, it, it felt like you have had 60 years to sort of walk around Jesus and get, get a, a different view. And I think uh, this is a, I think it's, a, it, it's an insight that is deeply embedded for people today. And that is nobody talks about anything objectively. Um, we all have a viewpoint. We all bring a story uh, to, to bear on whatever it is we talk about. Uh, and part of what we bring is who we are. So for me, as a straight white male, I have a whole set of things that I bring when I come to any subject. And you have yours and each of us from our different vantage points, you know, we, we bring that to any subject we talk about. But one of the interesting things is how much theology pretends not to do that, especially in the past. And that's why I think there is something fascinating in recent decades, even in much more formal theology. It, it seems like uh, uh, authors are being more forthcoming, that they're not just sort of abstracted observers, but they're participant observers and they, ha and they have uh, they have testimony as well as, as thoughts. Well, there's the turn that, um, you know, people began talking about with preaching uh, some 25 or so years ago. And that was the turn towards narrative is that people were no longer sort of in the, in the best uh, divinity schools, people were not really just talking about creating three point sermons anymore. But instead, the idea was, you know, how do we tell a, a story um, in preaching? And there was also a, 
a turn towards understanding narrative vis-a-vis -vis theology. And that was, that was a particularly strong turn around like Yale Divinity School. And um, the interest there was the move away from some of the arguments between more liberal and more conservative Christians, particularly around how we interpret the Bible. Um, a lot of scholars by the, I'd say by the 1980s had gotten to the point where they just thought the old liberal conservative divide was kind of a dead end in understanding scripture. And so they began to say, well, what's a better way of trying to understand the Bible instead of is this historically true or does this represent science? Um, and a group of people, again, mostly around Yale, uh, suggested that the best way to think about scripture was to think about it in terms of story. And as, as you thought about it in terms of story, it takes away some of the questions about scientific or historical truth. truth. Um, be, and it, it, cause you know, a story is a story and um, stories can be true um, without necessarily being factually accurate. And so, so this turn in biblical studies, this turn in, um, in preaching towards narrative just began, I think, shaping people differently in terms of how we approach the Bible. But theology just outright theology has been a little resistant to talking about this. Um, it, it, they like talking about narrative, but personal narrative has still been something that that theology has been shy about. Um, and I don't know what that's from. I mean, do you have any clues about how you might w w speculate uh, the you know, where that shyness about telling personal stories comes from in theological endeavor? You know, I think one of the pretensions of, uh, of patriarchy um, is that when men speak, when powerful men speak, they're not giving their opinion or speaking from the perspective. They're just telling you how things are. Right. Um, and so I think that's a big part of it. And I know this has been something you've thought about a good bit, Diana, about the special role of memoir and theology for women who are speaking about God. Do you want to talk about that a bit? In, a, the, in Freeing Jesus, at the very end of the book, I tell a story, which is a little bit of the reason that I wrote the whole book to begin with. And it, it's a story that goes back to seminary. I, I can't even remember exactly which professor said it to me. It was one of two different men but I remember the comment and I remember the flow of the conversation so clearly. And that was, it was, I had gotten out of a theology class and I just was talking to whichever professor this was and said, um, I noticed there are no women on the syllabus. Now this is in the mid 1980s. And so sadly enough, that would not have been all that weird um, <laughs> in the mid 1980s. But you know, there was enough sort of talk going around then that people were making an effort at least to include someone else other than just white men. And at least they were reaching toward <laughs> white women authors. And so I so I asked, I said, are we going to read any women? It was just kind of an offhanded thing. And the professor professor looked at me and he, and he said, well, like who? And I, I, I said, well, theology, theology, uh, we could read Teresa of Avila or Catherine of Siena or Dorothy Day. Now, those were all Catholics, of course, which at an evangelical seminary, they might have had some other problem with. But um, he looked at me and he said, those aren't theologians. They write memoir, not theology. And I could just remember standing there as like, you know, a 23 year old and and thinking to myself, what, what, what do you mean women don't write theology, <laughs> women write memoir? And, um, you know, now if uh, that conversation came up, uh, my answer would be quite tart. Um, as a matter of fact, it's like, uh, no, um, I actually have come to the conclusion that most theology is memoir. And um, I would have come back at him had I been more sure-footed or sure-handed at that time and uh, said something in the fact of, well, what about, you know, Augustine? You know, it's like, 
Augustine writes all this stuff about the freedom of the will and against the Donatists and all the theology that Augustine wrote. But where does it start? You know, it starts in the confessions. You know, it, it starts with a guy who is who feels incredibly guilty for stealing pears and abandoning his concubine. And so it's to me, it makes perfect sense where he gets to the fact that sin is is that sex is a sin and that um, everybody sins no matter what, because certainly his experience is that he did those things and he felt terrible about them. And to think about how his, his own personal actions then move towards his interpretation of scripture and then became basically orthodoxy is astonishing um and feminist theologians over the years have pointed out well you know that was augustine's problem maybe some of the rest of us have different problems um but you know in 1985 i wasn't ready to say that you know to a professor yeah. but but that is kind of the trajectory of theology is that when men wrote it um and then we have martin luther you know here i stand i can do no other um, and that becomes freedom of a Christian and bondage of the will or, 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 or John Wesley, uh, my heart is strangely warmed becomes yes. the, the Wesleyan movement and becomes all the sermons and the devotional literature and all the stuff that Wesley writes that is really West, the basis of Wesleyan theolo theology. And so, so yeah, men have tons of experiences and then, and then they wrote about them, but the church valorized them in such a point that they became you know theology and yes. the books that women wrote uh stayed in the categories of devotional literature yes yes um gosh so much uh as you were talking i'm thinking first of all how much of the bible is biography i mean you know genesis really doesn't get very far before we have a couple of characters and then really the book is structured by a, a series of biographical uh, uh, you know, explorations. There are a few books um, in the Bible that are first person uh, uh, memoirish type things. Nehemiah comes to mind. Really the, the book of Luke, uh, especially the middle part of it is a travel memoir. And Luke is you know, telling his uh, experience being part of this thing. Um, so, the, the integration of story with, uh, in fact, there really are no theological books in the Bible. You know, even the New Testament letters that people use for theology are letters written from somebody to somebody. So they take place within a story. And uh, so just the situatedness of, of even biblical, the biblical text tells us we shouldn't be embarrassed about this. But we went through a long period in Christian history when authoritative people, and they were virtually always men, really took this, this role that they were speaking objectively and, and their story had nothing to do with it. You know, the interesting thing about this, Diana, is when I reflect on the, you know, hundreds, probably thousands of books of theology that I've read, some of them are honest about this. Um, and and, and they, they aren't ashamed to admit that they have experience and that their experience affects what they say. But, you know, I think there's another kind of theological book that the, that the writer really needs no experience. Um, and, and the book is not written to reflect any experience. It's written, I mean, it's written for biographical reasons. It's written to say, I'm more orthodox than those guys, or uh, I'm going to challenge, you know, this or that uh, idea, uh, and I'm going to do it with some sort of objective, pure scholarship. Or I'm going to quote hundreds and hundreds of other people in my footnotes, and I'll even quote their experiences, but I will keep myself uh, removed uh, from this to create some air of distance and objectivity. Um, one other thing that struck me as you were speaking, thinking about, the, about women, you know, it's interesting. I was in graduate school studying literature in the 1970s, and one of my professors, Virginia Beecham, was one of the pioneers of what's what was then called women's literature because almost all the great literature was written by men and and that's changed a lot you know the corpus or the canon of western literature has changed a lot in recent 
uh, uh, decades. But I remember her, hearing her present on her work and a huge part of her work is saying, if we want to hear the voices of women through history, when they couldn't be published or very, very few were published. I mean, Emily Dickinson really, you know, stands out or in Christian theology. I mean, Hildegard von Bingen, what an incredibly amazing human being uh, and for her, you know, to be one of the first published voices of, of a woman in, uh, you know, in, uh, in Christian theology, but um, uh, but Virginia Beecham was was saying we have to we have to look at diaries uh, and, and journals as literature if we want to hear what the lives of women are, were like, and uh, and I just think all of that becomes very very rich. I also think when you mentioned Teresa of Avila. You know, if you if I try to imagine what it would have been like to be a woman in the Middle Ages, when everything is dominated by men, uh, it's a, a, a complete male, you know, patriarchal theological system. Uh, it, it makes perfect sense to me why women would talk about their visions, because in a way, it's the only it's the only way in to bring in a narrative. Nobody thought their life was important. So it, it, and they certainly didn't think their thought was important. Maybe one last thing I'll throw out on this. And they conveyed authority by saying that it was a vision. Yes, yes, that's right. And mm -hmm. it was a way to subvert that dominating voice. Right. Nobody is going to listen to me. So I'm going to tell my story and I'm going to do it in this uh, very powerful way. But this also makes sense when you go back to Plato. Uh, I think this is important background to Paul's thought in the New Testament. Plato apparently believed that women were not capable of being teachers. He wrote this somewhere, that women were not be able, capable of being teachers because they don't have minds. Oh, um, dear. Uh, but they are capable of being prophets or oracles because they have mouths. <laughs> and all they need <laughs> is vocal apparatus for the gods to speak through them, um, which seems to me you almost feel that same dichotomy, you know, in, in certain places in the New Testament. But it's a similar thing. Uh, Men aren't going to pay them respect for their thoughts, but they will for their proclamation of a vision. Yeah, it, it is a really interesting thing. And, you know, I've, I've thought about this question from a couple different angles. You know, one, of course, is obviously that Christianity is a institutionally a culture of patriarchy. You know, it's just in, the institutions that's the way they were established, at least since like the fourth century. And so we, we deal with all of that. Um, but then, so, so, so that's one sort of approach into it, trying to look around that and interrogate it and say, you know, where do we hear other voices or what was hiding at the edges? And there's lots of great stuff. And that's where historians and, and literary critics and, and other people have gone to try to look at memoir in interesting ways, letters and diaries. And it's not just, it, the interesting thing is not just women, it's also um, poorer men uh, men who were outside of systems of, of technical education and, and even sometimes men who rebelled against that. You know, if you think about, say, for example, the story of Abelard and Heloise, um, you know, in the high Middle Ages, you have these, these Abelard is a philosopher, Heloise is a student, they have this torrid affair, which is the thing that they're not supposed to do. And, um, you know, Abelard winds up getting castrated by Heloise's uncle. I mean, it's just an unbelievably um, R-rated story, you know, <laughs> for Christian history. But, you know, the, the church tried to, like, get rid of Abelard, because, I mean, here he is, he's a philosopher, he's like, teaching at the Sorbonne, he's arguing with Anselm, he, he's, he's got like all of the stuff you're supposed to have um, in order to be in a, a voice um, in the church, but he had a bad opinion and he had an affair. And um, those two things relegated him to an edge. And so that meant that his work, you know, and this often happened uh, to, to men, um, was, you know, sort of sent to the pyre 
and you know what what gets saved and what doesn't get saved is fascinating the, if we go back to augustine i think it's a really interesting uh, sort of story about him and pelagius you know everybody loves heaping on pelagius augustine's opponent around the idea of original sin pelagius wasn't sold on that idea um but basically for centuries we didn't know that certain writings of pelagius still survived that's only been a more recent historical discovery uh, but through most of church history all we had we thought that everything from pelagius since he lost the argument um, had been destroyed and the all we had was augustine's opinion of what pelagius had said and what pelagius's life was about and so it's it goes even further in some senses than patriarchy it even runs yes. into sort of this what the authorities deemed appropriate um to profess or save or what was in line with you know their own power or whatever they whatever the interest was there and so you so you get these these edgy figures like anselm or pelagius that obviously are men that had power but yet because they questioned some of the what i would say is the 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 central voice of church's authority um they got in trouble too um so so we have this tons of material uh through church history that's really been lost um accidentally um hidden uh by people who were trying to sort of protect it for the future but we didn't it gets found much later um, or, you know, destroyed on purpose. And, and so I, that's one of the things I think about a lot is if we had more voices through the history of Christianity, what shape would Christianity have today? Mm. You know, if we had yes. taken all of those stories seriously and allowed those voices into the mix. And here we're just even talking about Western Christianity because, you know, it's basically yes. European based through through much of the those 1500 years. Um, you know, if we had those voices, uh, what, what would Christianity look like? And, and, and that it makes me wonder, and it also makes me makes me very sad because I think what we've lost you know what were the voices of the poor what were the voices of women what were the voices of the men who were asking questions and having the doubts yes. and if we had even a you know what we know now is we just have oh i don't know you know maybe we got a thousandth if that much mm -hmm. of that kind of material that was produced yeah. and um so that well, that, that really kind of it opens our minds to thinking about the tradition differently, I, th I, I think. And I think that's one of the exciting things about this flowering of memoir in the last several decades about religious memoir. And it's not just a formulaic thing that, you know, I'm familiar with and you are too, but it's all the folks from evangelical backgrounds, the um, sort of stereotypical testimony, which is a kind of memoir, but it was, you know, it was very stylized and formulaic. I once was lost but now I'm found, I was blind, but now I see it was a, here's how terrible it was before I found Jesus. Here's how great it is now that I have. There's certainly that kind, and there's some, some obviously truth to that. But what's happened, it seems to me in recent decades is more and more people have said, I want to talk about, I, I want to try to be a little more vulnerable and forthcoming and true to the experiences that I've had, including the experiences, not just of answered prayers, but of devastating, you know, senses of abandonment by God. And, mm -hmm. and, and I want to talk not just about the presence of God in my life. I want to talk about times I've doubted God. And, and uh, I, I want to not, not just talk about how wonderful church is. I want to tell the terrible truth about, you know, how I was treated by this priest or by that minister or, or whatever. And what this starts to do, I think, is it breaks some taboos it, uh, of saying, you can't talk about that. You can't, you can't acknowledge that. And I think this is going to have a huge effect in our theology going forward. Those stories cannot be uh, silenced. I mean, just one example, when 
LGBTQ uh, people started uh, telling their stories, uh, uh, it, it, it becomes a data set now that, right. that before people could dehumanize the other, but now in this book, the other is, is humanized. You know, that just makes me um, remember one of the, the books that I've wanted to write uh, for several decades, actually. I thought first thought about it when I was in graduate school in the late 80s and the early 90s. And um, I know there are some other historians who wanted to write about this same figure as well, Lauren Winner from Duke being one of them. Uh, and that is, in the 19th century, there was this amazing woman by the name of Vida Scudder. And she was a professor at Wellesley um, College, women, the Women's College outside of Boston. And she was a Christian socialist. She was born in an evangelical congregationalist family. And um, as she grew up, she actually rejected evangelical religion in favor of very high church Anglicanism. And so she founded a religious order, uh, of basically lay nuns, you know, women who uh, kept a rule of life, who prayed together, who lived together. There's a there's actually still a retreat center um, in Massachusetts that was part of this original community that she founded, and um, and so she's and she's also a professor of literature. You may have run into her um, that way. She was one of the first women. American women to get a PhD at Oxford University, and it was um, in, in literature. And so um, she's just a remarkable person, this high church Anglican, post-evangelical, uh, Christian socialist, and she, and she was a lesbian. And so the problem was, is when she died, which was in the middle part of the 20th century, she lived to be quite old. She actually wrote two different autobiographies, one when she was 40 and another one when she was 60. And um, yet she's very reticent, you know, of talking about her personal life. She talks about her companion. She talks about her travels with her companion, all this sort of stuff. And then when she died, she left instructions for all of her papers to be burned mm. because she didn't want anybody to know about her sexual relationship with her lifetime companion and talk about i mean a tragic loss to the to the experience of the church you know we had to come into these decades before gay and lesbian persons transgender persons begin telling their stories because as recently as the early part of the 20th century uh a uh, a figure of towering importance in American history, like Vita Scudder. She was as important as Jane Addams, but nobody knows about her because she was a lesbian and had all her papers burned. Yes, um, yes. And, um, and, and so those are the kinds of story, when I talk about the stories we've lost, can you imagine if that story had been told in the 1920s or the 1930s and the kind of pain that would have relieved from the lives of some of our friends now yeah. um it would have begun a conversation at, at least 50 or 60 years earlier yeah. than the conversation that we're currently having about memoir theology and sexuality now that's uh would you say her name once more vita Scudder, V I D A Scudder, um, S C R U D D E R Scudder, yeah, Scudder, S S C U D D E R. Okay. Yeah. Um, in just a minute, a couple of minutes, then I think we'll open it up to folks for for uh, questions, and maybe some questions are already coming in through the chat, and uh, in a few minutes, uh, uh, I think Robin will be reading us uh, some of those and we'll get a chance to respond, but I, I wanted maybe to turn toward the personal for you and I in these last few minutes. Um, and I'll just take a, a, a minute to say, you know, this most recent book, Faith After Doubt, was my opportunity to try to be, to do, uh, it, it's not shaped like a memoir, but to, I, I tell a number of other people's stories, but I tell a number of my own uh, stories too. And um, 
And I, I think there are steps of vulnerability. I had a lot of people say to me, I never, I think this is the most vulnerable you've ever been in a book. And it just seemed to talk about something as personal as doubt. I had to, first of all, why would I even be interested in talking about this if it didn't have a deep connection to my own spiritual life? And so, uh, but probably the book that I've written that's most directly memoir is the book I read on the Galapagos Islands. And, and the, the thing that's very vulnerable about that book is that's the book of everything I've written where I talk about one of the greatest loves of my life, which is my love for the outdoors and nature and wildlife and the physical world and the earth and all the rest. And I, I do think there something happens when we take steps toward vulnerability to tell about our pain and to tell about our love. Um, that, that I think, I think it's important. It, that was, that's been important for me to do that I could imagine going through my professional career as a writer or, or my years as a preacher and having plenty to talk about without ever getting to deep pain and deep love, which I, I think many of us have found are, are the truly transforming things in our lives. And that's another reason to me that that memoir is so important or however we talk about the, the disclosure of our own stories as honestly and transparently as we can. Because when we get closest to our deepest love and our deepest pain, I think we're getting closest to our experience of the divine. So uh, I'd love to hear from you on that. Um, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. And that is, uh, my husband, Richard, uh, who you know, and are friends with Richard, he wants to know if you were Neo in your early uh, books. You know, um, the, the truth is, uh, well, a, a, a longer answer, I'd say that I, I've come to have of literature, a sort of uh, the, the same uh, attitude as a lot of psychotherapists have about dreams, you know, it, it, in in dreams, uh, uh, many psychotherapists think that all of the characters in our dreams are playing parts of ourselves. And that I think there's some truth to that in, in literature too. But Neo was a composite of my experiences and many other people's experiences too, yeah. Because I, I, I have several occasions gone back to those books and sort of tried yeah. to pull out the threads and figure out which ones were you, which parts were you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, um, you know, the two main characters, Neo and then this pastor named Dan, I feel like I'm, I can see, you know, both of them are drawn from parts of me. And in some ways, if that book is about an argument and a conversation, it's the, it's the conversation between the conservative part of me and the progressive part of me uh, trying to, uh, you know, work that out. Yeah. And that was right when I got to know you, yeah. <laughs> when you were right. having that conversation with yourself. <laughs> so yes. it was it was actually kind of fun to become friends then. Um, yes. I love I love what you just said, you know, about uh, about the the things that we deeply love, and and also you know uh, the things that that have hurt us, the the, the our fears, our doubts, our our vulnerab vulnerabilities, you know, and oftentimes those are the same things um just kind of different sides of them or where they show up at different times in our own lives and um in the in my last two books in grateful and then in praying jesus i i thought long and hard um but told story about having been abused when i was a, a teenage girl uh by a relative and i and i i think that this is actually important to talk about because it is my I love memoir and and that's where I've always wanted to invest most of my literary sorts of chops and my my crafting abilities as as a writer and in part that's because I was really influenced by Kathleen Norris and Annie Dillard and Roberta Bondi and Anne Lamont um, particularly in the 1990s when I first ran into um, those, their books. And so I, I literally saw myself um, as wanting to be part of that line of, of writers. And so, so memoir has always been important to me, but part of my commitment to memoir is there is always part of our lives 
that we we do hold in reserve yeah. is and, and this is <laughs> this is a little bit of an oddball thing to say i think in 21st century culture because we have become a much less reserved culture about personal story and in a sense um there is a sort of turn towards memoir that's almost um kind of like a spiritual voyeurism where mm -hmm. you sort of tell everything you know mm -hmm. and maybe that's a that it has appeal for certain people but that's not the approach that i've always taken to it yeah. what i've the approach that i take to memoir is that my story is truly my story and to tell it honestly but also to tell it appropriately in ways that um, educate in ways that invite people to see their own stories more deeply. I don't think of my story as my story. You know, if you if you pick up one of my books and you're reading it, it's not ultimately about me. I'm actually trying to craft the story so that it's about you. Mm, that yeah. it's an invitation to whoever's reading it to say, oh, I've had that experience too, or, um, I've had an experience similar to that, or I didn't have that experience, but yet I came to a same conclusion. And so I always feel like I'm successful as a writer insofar as readers are encountering what they love and where their fears and doubts are. And so I tell as much of those things as I'm comfortable doing. Um, in terms of art, in terms of the poetry of what I'm putting on the page, and in you know terms of the you know when you're in public, you you make you really do make choices about what parts of your li life you have to keep, yeah. you know, to your to yourself. And I think that's one of the tricky things about memoir. And uh, there's you know, sometimes I hear sermons and somebody gets up in the pulpit and just starts, I, me, this. I one time heard an entire sermon about a guy who, who, who told us about his sailing trip off of Cape Cod one year. And it was like, there, there was almost no point to it, except that we learned that he was a really, 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 really rich guy who had given up a lot to become an Episcopal priest. And it was like, that's not the kind of memoir that I think forwards um, yeah. the sorts of issues that I care about in the world, about love and justice and, and um, connection and vulnerability and those kinds of things. Well, uh, before we turn to questions, let me just say, there's a sentence in your book, Freeing Jesus, that uh, really arrested me um, and I, in fact, I quote it in my next book, which is called Do I Stay Christian? And it's where you just, you, you said these three words, I love Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, there are an awful lot of people who write theology who would find it very hard to say that. Uh, and it, it to me was this beautiful, uh, this is a very moving moment for me in, in the book. Oh, um, when thank when you. you say those those three words. Well, let's uh, go to Robin. And uh, Robin, any questions that you want to bring us, we'll be glad to jump in. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Diana. Um, what an interesting conversation. All kinds of comments coming in on the chat, some questions. Um, some of the quotes that I wrote down, you just mentioned the quote from Diana's book. Diana, when you said your answer would be quite tart if you were having that conversation today, I couldn't <laughs> love that more. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's so many of us that wish we had today's perspective years ago when we were having conversations and might have gotten a little bit more tart. Um, really quickly, the very first question that came in was a question about all this goose stuff. So let me just say, um, and I, I apologize for not making sure that everyone knew what Wild Goose Festival was, but we will be having Wild Goose Festival September 2nd through 5th in Hot Springs, North, North Carolina at the Hot Springs Campground. I put the website for the festival in the chat. So please look it up if you're not familiar with it. Feel free to reach out to us on the Facebook page or um, through email, through the website. 
however as most convenient for you. Um, just a little recap, you know, taking steps towards vulnerability, telling our stories, what would Christianity look like today if the stories from so long ago had been included, if, if we hadn't lost some of that information, just so interesting. Um, the next question that came in was from Drew Willard and says, recently reading Power of Myth, and Joseph Campbell said that we don't have myth slash ritual like Vision Quest for young people. Would that be something to reclaim for Christians or even Americans in a broader sense? Hmm. You, I, I'd love to say something about that, Diana, unless you want go to jump for in it. first. No, you go for it. Well, you know, uh, I mean, what that question makes me think about uh, uh, is, especially D Diana and I were mentioning this place, Ring Lake Ranch out in Wyoming. And when you go there, uh, there are pictographs on, uh, on many uh, of the walls, uh, rock walls there. And, and our best uh, understanding, or one of our understandings is that uh, people, and especially young, probably young men, went out, uh, maybe women as well, I don't know, um, but they would go out to, to have a vision quest to, in a sense, find their message and find their meaning and, and get a clear sense of who they were as an adult uh, moving uh, out into the world. And, and so many of our cultures have had coming of age rituals um, uh, for men and for women. And, uh, it, you know, we have them accidentally. Um, but, uh, you know, for example, going to college is a certain kind of coming of age ritual. Joining the military is a certain kind of coming of age ritual. So we, I think human beings need them and we have them in different ways. But it just strikes me at what a critical moment we're in, especially, I'll just say, in the Christian faith, to if we, we need to decide what it is we think it, it means to be a Christian and what we want to introduce our children to, to give them a chance to say, how do I make this my own? And uh, the appropriation of faith for people in their coming of age process, um, taking the faith that was their parents or their churches or their priests and making it their own faith. And, and in a sense, that always means their own unique version of it. Um, that, that's something it seems to me, it would be so helpful for us to provide you know, some milestones or uh, some pathway to help people go through that process. I'm sure that's part of what the old ideas of confirmation and uh, and catechesis and so on were supposed to mean, but boy, we've got it. To me, that's a wide open area for us to rediscover. And and you think, for example, uh, among Mormons, you know, Mormons have a, an example of this when they go off on their mission trip. Um, and there are things in different Christian groups have mission year and and so on. But one of the things about those experiences, uh, pilgrimages you go somewhere, you do something, a mission trip, right? And you come back and you have a story to tell. Um, and it's a place where you got stretched beyond normalcy and you, you had some extraordinary experiences and now you have stories to tell. This is so big a part of our identity formation. And I think it's a, a really deep part of our faith formation. When you were talking, Brian, there was a question that kind of, I saw just flip through the chat and it, the person said, um, well, most of us aren't writers. And um, I was thinking about what you were just saying is that in a, in a very real way, every single one of us is writing our lives. Mm -hmm. And that even if you're not a person who is a writer who gets you know your words printed between the pages of a, a, two, two covers in a book, um, you're, you're authoring and yes. acting in um, your story and everyone has a story and I, I think that part of we, the, the idea of, of ritual marking for younger adults is really important and I also think that the capacity for older adults to be able to somehow share their stories um, is very important um, how they pass on 
um, what they've learned and create memory um, of their life experience for the people who come behind them. And so in a sense, I, I think the idea of ritual and memory of writing a life of the fact that we are all, you know, Shakespeare said it, you know, all, all the world's a stage. We are but actors on it. In a sense, we're all writing some script. And um, I, I wish that more people just kind of thought about that. You know, it, it, there, there is, you are writing a story. That's what your life I is. Yes, and, and, and of course that brings back the, the tradition of storytelling. And uh, one of the great things about Wild Goose is that there's an awful lot of storytelling that happens. People sitting together on a lawn chair by a campfire telling stories. Um, my wife uh, went to visit her, um, one of her brothers recently and uh, one of her brother's children is on the autism spectrum. And uh, obviously over COVID we hadn't seen, she hadn't seen her nephew. And when she was with him, he just had so much poise and sat with her at, at dinner and just they had this wonderful conversation. And Grace went up to her sister-in-law and said, I can't believe how much he's grown and how much, and, and then uh, uh, her, uh, her, her sister-in-law said, well, you have to understand we have drilled him in this. We've helped him learn what are the questions you ask to carry on a good conversation. It's part of what, you know, autism from his meant. He doesn't have a sense of that. He just feels awkward. But when he was given the right kinds of questions to ask, he then developed facility in it having positive social engagements. Oh, wow. Well, what strikes me is, you know, one of the questions that really would be great for us maybe for all of us are a little bit on the spectrum and we need to learn how to ask is, tell me a story. Tell me a story about a happy memory you have. Tell me a story about a time you uh, surprised yourself with what you could do. Tell me, and those kinds of tell me a story about questions evoke from people, the storyteller um, that's in all of us. And, and I think they, it's, I think that's pretty important to us. You know, I think we both need to hear those stories and we need people who are curious about them so that we get, we find out what comes out when somebody asks us that kind of a question. I think that um, faith after doubt, uh, it, it provides a framework for giving people questions to ask of their own lives at different, at different stages. And, and you're, it's really becomes an invitation and uh, you're, you're so good at those kinds of pedag pedagogical tools. You get your readers to really think. So I think that your work has actually done that. Um, I, freeing Jesus might be a little bit more subtle uh, in that approach, but what I tried to do by writing my own story was to get my readers to think, Oh, how did I think of Jesus when I was eight years old? Mm. You know, and so, and that becomes a question. You know, it, people yes. don't often sit down and think about that memory. Um, yes. And yet, if you ask someone the question overtly, lots of people have some sort of answer to that. And the answer might be, mm. "Well, I wasn't a Christian. I never thought about Jesus. I just heard his name, <laughs> and I kind of wondered about him." or it could be more of the kind of Methodist Sunday school story um, that I tell in my book. Um, but um, that's, I think what written memoir and sort of teaching does is it introduces questions that provide frameworks for people to be able to go in and, and get those prompts as it were yes. to tell their own stories. Robin, is there another question? Sure. So um perfect segue uh question specific to how to write a, their story and not um create barriers with the audience so i'll read the question um working on a spiritual memoir of sorts it'll cover years of drug addiction the story of my career in environmental politics in dc oh, wow. but it's headed into theological territory since i ended up taking a turn towards jesus and justice work her question is how can I speak to the broadest audience? I'm afraid that progressive slash science slash enviro types will run when they read Christian and traditional Christians will flee from mediation 
and heretical theology. I hope to be as open and in inclusive as possible. Making a bridge between communities would really appreciate your thoughts. And that's from Melanie Griffin. Wow. It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I just want to know, but I ahead, never Dana. think about, I never think about my audience when I'm writing. I, I think about my story and, um, am I telling it as truthfully, as lovingly and as honestly as I possibly can. And, um, then I let the chips fall where they may on the other side of the, on, of, uh, of the process. And, um, the truth is, is that every story invites many people and every story offends many people. <laughs> well said. Uh, uh, the, the, the only criticism I have of that question is when we only have a couple minutes left, it's just such a great, a big question. We ought to come back for another hour just to talk about that. But the two things I'll offer, uh, I'm sure somebody famous said this, I can't remember who it was, but what is most personal to you is most universal to me. And, and when we can get to the deepest, most personal elements of our story, I think other people find a connection. And I think those deepest, most personal elements that end up being most universal are two things, emotions. How can we name and describe and it, through our speaking or writing, help other people feel what we felt? Uh, and then second, desires. What was motivating us? What was drawing us? What was the unfulfilled need? What was the, what was the quest? And, you know, it, emotions and desires are what put motion into stories and they are what put motion into our lives. And, uh, and that's the point of contact, I think, to, to, to look for uh, with people. You want one more? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, so one of the comments quoted Brian, you, in, when speaking, said, as transparent as we are able. And the question was, well, what are, the, what are some of the limiting factors, I guess, to that transparency? Uh, yeah, well, uh, since our time is limited, I'll just say, I think that's a very personal decision that different people make. I, I have a friend, I won't mention her name, but she wrote a memoir that was phenomenally revealing about painful elements of her life and of her husband's life. And um, she actually consulted me on it when she was writing this and asked what I felt. And of course, my big question was, well, how does your husband feel? And, you know, she had cleared that with him and he was, he was okay with, the, with that transparency on her part. But I think we, you know, I think we have a right to tell our own story. I think we have to be careful about it how we tell other people's stories. And um, so that would be one of the limitations I, I would think about. One of the things I hold in mind is very similar to what Brian is just saying, is that I tell, I tell my own story. Well, I said, I do reserve parts of it because there are parts of me that are very private. Um, but uh, when it comes to telling other people's stories, my, I'm always saying to myself, do no harm, do no harm, do no mm -hmm. harm. And so that is a really interesting line to walk sometimes when you're telling a story of your own life and someone has, for example, hurt you. And so, so you have to figure out how do you tell the story in your voice? So it's kind of from your perspective. And meanwhile, you're doing no harm to the others. And, um, I, I think I've failed at that test sometimes, um, but I hold myself to it and do work. I do strive to um, not fail at it. Guys, thank you so much. We are two minutes over. Um, that last comment, Diana got me. <laughs> oh. You know, if we could do that every day, what a great world this would be. So you guys, thank you so much for the writings that are in the marketplace, thanks to you guys, but specifically just wanted to mention Faith After Doubt, um, Brian's latest book, and Freeing Jesus, Diana's latest book, and Wild Goose Festival, September 2nd through 5th. Can't wait. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for being here.